The big question, how do you use chemistry to catch a thief? The clues add up. There is nothing like a great dinner after a long, hard day in the field. Felix patted his flat stomach as he lounged in a camp chair beside the fire. I'm stuffed. They were all sitting around the campfire again, listening to the wood crackle and pop, and watching sparks rise up toward the night sky. It was perfectly clear, and the moon had not yet risen, so the stars were incredibly bright. Amy had never seen so many stars before, but now she could easily see the pale streak of the Milky Way as it rambled across the heavens. Too stuffed to eat roasted marshmallows? Tess asked, walking up with a bag of marshmallows and enough roasting sticks for everyone. Wait a minute, I think my appetite just came back, Felix said. He pushed two marshmallows onto the end of a stick and held them out near the flames. Tess pulled up a chair and glanced around. I know it feels a little strange without Dr. Forrester here tonight. How about we play a little game to liven things up? You mean like charades or 20 questions? Daria asked. Well, you guys should know me pretty well by now, Tess said, grinning at them. I was thinking more along the lines of a good, rousing game of spot the chemical changes. Rules, please, Amy said, giggling. You must identify a chemical change that's taking place within the boundaries of the camp and explain why it's a chemical change, Tess explained. For every correct answer, you get one point. And the person with the most points wins, said Felix, popping his first toasted marshmallow into his mouth. Matt's hand shot up. The wood in the campfire is undergoing a chemical change, isn't it? And it's giving off both heat and light in the process. A point for Matt, Tess cried. Yes, when wood burns, it is undergoing a very dramatic chemical change. And it's not reversible either, Daria chimed in. You can't turn the ashes into wood again. Excellent, Tess agreed. Who's next? As my marshmallows are toasting, Felix murmured, they're turning a delicious golden brown on the outside and they smell heavenly too. That's got to be because a chemical reaction is taking place as they're heating up. A point for Felix, Tess said. The sugary substance of the marshmallows is undergoing a chemical change as it gets hot. It changes color and also gives off an odor, both signs that a chemical change is taking place. And you can't untoast marshmallows any more than you can unburn wood, Crystal said, gently pulling a perfectly roasted marshmallow off her stick and admiring it before taking a bite. Digesting marshmallows and other food has got to be a chemical reaction too, Amy offered. And we know the changes take place because our bodies grow and we get energy from the food we eat. A point for Amy who is absolutely correct that all sorts of chemical changes take place in our digestive tracts, Tess said. As we eat these marshmallows, for example... Compounds in them are broken down in our stomach and intestines. During this process, atoms are rearranged to form entirely different molecules that our bodies use as building blocks for making substances, carrying out tasks, repairing cells and structures, and much more. Certain chemical changes that take place in cells are responsible for capturing energy released when compounds from food are broken down even further, and then converting that energy into a form that cells can use. Tess pulled a marshmallow off her roasting stick, letting it cool slightly. Just think, there are trillions of cells in our bodies, and at any given moment, countless chemical changes are taking place in each one. I've got one, Crystal said, slipping a ring off her little finger. My mom gave me this silver ring. She'll shine it up for me now and then with a special cloth, but within a couple of weeks it gets a little dull, like there's dirt on it. Tarnishing, that's what she calls it. Is tarnishing a chemical change? 
It certainly is, Tess said, and it typically happens when molecules on the surface of a silver object interact with sulfur-containing compounds in the air. Unlike wood burning or food cooking, chemical changes such as tarnishing take place quite slowly. Definitely a point for Daria. As the game continued, Amy noticed that Julian was lost in thought, but he'd been like that all day. Daria, on the other hand, seemed nervous. Every few minutes, she turned and looked out into the darkness in the direction Dr. Forrester had driven away before dinner. Amy thought of Inspector Ellis. In every book, he listed all the clues in his notebook to help him see the case more clearly, just as she had been doing. Amy didn't have her notebook handy, so she picked up a stick and made a sort of list in the sandy soil. She drew symbols that stood for backpacks and disappearances, cell phones and snakes, discoveries and appearances and things people had said. Inside her head, several clues fell together. Click, click, click. There was a pause in the game, and Amy took advantage of it. She leaned back in her camp chair and let out a huge yawn. Sorry, everybody, she said. I'm tired and I'm going to bed. I want to be wide awake and alert tomorrow morning when Dr. Forrester comes back. With the sheriff, she added, emphasizing the three words. As she stepped past Matt's chair, she tugged on his shirt, a signal that he should follow her. What's up? Matt asked as he joined her where she stood beyond the reach of the firelight. I'm doing what any good detective would do. I've put the clues together and come up with a plan. A plan for what? A plan to solve the case of the missing fossils, she said softly. Meet me outside the kitchen tent after Julian and Felix have fallen asleep. Amy picked her way slowly across the clearing toward the kitchen tent, trying not to make a sound. The moon had risen in the star-spangled sky as a silver sliver that gave off just enough light so she could see the shapes of all the tents. She paused and listened outside Tess's tent, but she heard nothing and hoped Tess was sound asleep. As Amy neared the kitchen, a familiar shape detached from the larger shape of the canvas structure. What took you so long, Matt said in a loud whisper. I've been waiting here for half an hour. Amy placed a finger gently on her brother's lips. Not so much noise. I'm late because Daria was tossing and turning and it took forever for her to fall asleep. Julian was asleep in record time, but Felix kept fiddling with his backpack for quite a while. Matt swatted at an insect. So what are we doing here? We're setting a trap for our fossil thief, Amy replied. Do you know who it is? Amy answered thoughtfully. A good detective suspects everyone until she has the evidence to prove who did what and why. The plan. Set a trap. Use science. Ice cubes slash water. Plaster of Paris. Suspects may leave footprints behind. Examine evidence. Okay, Miss Good Detective, how exactly are we going to do that? Well, I'm guessing that whoever took the fossils is feeling pretty scared right now because of the sheriff coming tomorrow. It's just a hunch, but I think he or she might try to return the fossils to the lab tent tonight. You mean we have to stand guard here all night and keep watch? Matt hissed. Sis, I'm so tired I can hardly keep my eyes open. Amy shushed her brother again. We're not going to stand guard. We're going to use chemistry to identify the culprit instead. Chemistry? Matt asked in a tone that made it sound like he thought his sister was crazy. What do we know about chemistry that could help solve a crime? Quite a bit, actually, if you've been paying attention over the past few days. Amy lifted the flap of the kitchen tent. Follow me. She slipped inside and flicked on her flashlight. After grabbing a big bowl and a dish towel from a shelf, 
She headed over to the little refrigerator. First, we need ice, she said, handing Matt the bowl and laying the towel on the bottom of it. As she emptied the ice cubes from two trays into the bowl, the towels muffled their clatter. She listened for a minute, straining to hear any sounds that might indicate someone else was awake. Except for the crickets, there was silence. Now, let's head for the lab, she instructed. Amy stopped outside the lab tent and took the bowl of ice cubes from Matt. One by one, she placed the ice cubes on the ground directly in front of the tent's entrance. Amy, what on earth are you doing? Matt asked impatiently. I'm exploiting a physical change in matter as the first step to solving the case, Amy replied. The ice cubes will slowly melt over the next few hours. They'll change states from a solid to a liquid, making the ground wet here right in front of the tent. Anyone who enters the lab will get the soles of his or her shoes nice and damp. So what good do wet shoes do us? The irritation in Matt's voice was growing. Trust me. Amy stepped inside the lab, flicked on her flashlight, and shone it where boxes and supplies were stacked in one corner. Help me find the plaster of Paris. Matt quickly found the bag of white powder and dragged it into the center of the tent. Okay, now what? Amy handed her brother a pair of latex gloves, from a box on a shelf and put on a pair herself. Help me scatter plaster dust on the floor of the tent. Let's start in the far corner and work back toward the entrance. Amy, this is not just crazy, Matt said, starting to scatter the plaster dust. But Dr. Forrester is going to be very annoyed when she sees this mess. The plaster is the second part of my plan and makes use of a chemical change, Amy said. Remember what happened when Tess mixed water and plaster of Paris at the dig site today? It underwent a chemical change, and the wet plaster hardened. Exactly. So if someone comes into the lab tent tonight, he or she will step in the water from the melting ice cubes just before entering. The soles of this person's shoes will be wet as he or she starts to walk around, and the plaster dust will stick to them. A grin started to spread across Matt's face. The plaster and water will undergo a chemical change and harden into plaster, Amy finished. We saw today how well plaster sticks to things. It should stick to shoe bottoms at least as well. Then, tomorrow morning at breakfast, we'll check everyone's shoes, and whoever is sporting plaster in the treads will have a lot of explaining to do. Matt was quiet for a long moment. Amy, you are a good detective. That's brilliant. Amy beamed.